Now, one of the main automation technologies we're seeing in schools is robotics. Young children love robots. Um, it relates to their love of toys and the automation of their toys, but they really engage with robotic devices. So robots can relate, though, to more than just um, androids, robots that look like human beings, look like toys. They can also be many other forms. So the simplest is the robotic arm. Now, a robot arm, though, doesn't have to look like an arm. It could look like a plotter, um, which we can use to write, and it can be put vertically, so it can write on a, on a whiteboard, for example. It could also have various attachments so that it, it can extrude plastic, for example, and be a 3D printer. But it doesn't have to extrude just plastic. It can also extrude icing for icing a cake or chocolate for making 3D chocolate models. So many other uses can be put to a simple robot arm that moves in two dimensions, which is what we call a plotter. Uh, if we now add a third dimension, we can start making three-dimensional objects. And if we can take that idea now and make it mobile, we have a mobile robot. And this comes into the more popular forms of robots. But we shouldn't discount robot arms. Of course, while robot arms don't have an awful lot of applied use for problem solving, they are very easy for students to make. And we can make them using some plastic tubes and syringes to make um, claws open and close and move around. And I've given you a little video clip explaining that process. But you can take that to where things will be in industry, where we use robots to perform manual tasks. Now, not a huge number of manual tasks needing to be done in a school context that students can create solutions to. But they can start thinking about how these robot arms are used in industry. And it won't be long before we have Android robots in our homes, where the robots will be doing gardening and so forth. We, we already see a number of simple robots in our homes. Um, automated vacuum cleaners, automated lawn mowers that move around. But we will soon see fully human-sized um, androids that look like human beings with two arms, two legs and so forth, being able to do a much wider range of tasks because their arms are more human-like and able to manipulate the devices in our homes that have been designed for human arms to operate. But I've given you another clip showing where robot arms will be useful in kitchens. And the idea of automation has various advantages. One is it can replicate things very quickly but it can also replicate the tasks very accurately. So once a set of robot arms have been um, programmed to create the world's best um, souffle, it will be able to be used with any set of these robot arms to create the world's best souffle. So if we have the world's very best chef train the robot arm, and it can be done by attaching sensors to their own arms, and the robot arm will then model exactly what they do. We can have, in your own kitchen, five-star restaurant quality meals produced consistently, accurately and quickly, and most importantly, cheaply, without the need to go to um, the world's very best restaurants. Now, at the moment, these, these devices are still relatively expensive, uh, but their price will come down dramatically as this technology develops. So you need to be preparing your students for a world where a lot more things are automated than we currently see. Now, robots have become really popular in schools. Of course, they can be um, programmed and they can do fun activities and then they're tactile and visually responsive so we can see what's happening immediately in terms of students' programs. Seeing things happening on the screen is it's interesting enough, but actually seeing something moving around physically as a response to the programs that the students have made is much more engaging to them. So there have been many of these different um, robot kits developed in the last few years, from 
tiny little Ozobots, which are one of my favourites, because you can have an entire class set in a small pencil, ca pencil case. Um, and these robots can follow lines, and you can actually draw lines on paper. And by using different colours in the lines, you can give it different instructions, such as different lights to shine, or to turn left or turn right, or to reverse direction, and various other ways of programming, relatively complex programs, using very simple instructions that students can do just with drawing lines on paper. Then there are other sort of more toy-based robots that are very powerful in terms of the AI in that they can recognize faces and respond in various ways to students. Um, and the dash dot robots are very popular in that space. We have the Sphero robots, Sphero ro robots, uh, which are popularized by the BB-8 from the Star Wars movies. Uh, so it's a little ball that can move around. Now it can move around just by um, using a mobile phone and giving it directions like a remote control toy, but it can also be programmed. So you can use block-based languages to program it to follow instructions and to move through a maze or to uh, play various games and do various activities. Now it's not incredibly accurate, so it has limited uses in terms of problem solving, but it can teach the concepts quite well and is very engaging because of its randomness and um, ability to move very quickly. Then you have kits that are more designed for students to be creative. The Lego kits are probably the most popular in this space, where students can build lots and lots of different types of constructions that can incorporate motors and little microcontrollers that will tell motors to turn on and off and arms to move and legs to move and so forth and wheels to turn. And students can program these using block-based programming languages to do various activities. Then we have more self-contained kits, such as the Edison robot, which has been designed to be able to follow a line. So it's got a little sensor that allows you to follow a line and you can then do various activities and program it to do various tasks. And then you have more complex um, Lego kits, such as the Mindstorm ones, which allow you to build more detailed robots that can play games such as soccer against one another um, do dance routines, which is very popular for primary schools, where you program the robots to perform dance routines, and the students can perform the dance routines along with the robots. So they write their own program, and it performs the dance, and the students perform the dance along with the robot. And there are competitions that students can go into um, in regard to that. Then you have the VEX robot kits, which are very popular in the United States. So they're like Lego, but a bit more of a combination of Lego and Meccano, where you can use some metal device, metal uh, constructions and put things together and make uh, more complex robots. Then there's a range of very low cost robots called MakerBots. Now these are all metal, but they work on the same principle as the Arduino boards, where there are lots and lots of sensors and um, you can program them together, but it's they're more fiddly and they're not as easy to use in a primary school setting, but they can be very powerful. Now, one of the big advantages of these is you can do completely redesign the robots. So you can make your own 3D printer very easily, or a 3D plotter, um, or a mobile robot, and lots of different types of configurations. So the flexibility allows students to create solutions to problems with different robots to perform different tasks, depending upon how the robot is configured. Does it need tracks, or wheels, or legs? Does it need arms? Does it need um, uh, cameras to be able to see things or sounds to be able to detect sounds? And all of these different possibilities can be incorporated into the student's design of solutions to problems through creating their robots. Now, we shouldn't also discount other forms of robots, such as um, robots that can go through water. And what we'll talk about next is robots that can fly which are called drones. So there are many different ways of configuring robots to do various tasks depending upon what's needed. Now, in using robots, you've explored some of them already in this course, such as the B-Bots, uh, and we can use instruction cards to lay out the different instructions that the robot will follow. We can then also use our block-based languages to do slightly more complex programs, 
and then we can eventually do text-based programming where we get down to very specific uh, complex programs where the robot is doing many things at once and detecting things with its sensors and moving and various other processes involved in the problem solving and you'll be doing some of that with the more complex robots kits um, doing an exploration of Mars and some of the processes that we see real robots doing at the moment when they're exploring planets by having to be able to detect what is around them, to move in various ways and to make decisions based upon um, the events that it, are occurring around it in terms of what it senses and what task it has to do as part of its mission. Now the final aspect of robotics is virtual robots where we can simulate physical robots on our computers using software and give them the same instructions that we would give our normal robots with block-based programming languages for example and we'll have a little video showing an image of the robot moving around in its space and performing tasks. So if we don't have the um, physical kits we can use these virtual robots to teach students how to do the same things through the virtual um, environments. Not quite as engaging and tactile as physical robots, but certainly it is an alternative that is available. Now in the activity this week, what I would like you to do is to look at an example of a project that students um, are challenged to do, which is rescuing Rapunzel from uh, her tower and students are to create a, a robot or an automated device to enact that rescue. So think about what is involved in um, doing that sort of task with your students as a project-based challenge task and how would you design a similar task to teach your students um, and engage them in a similar way with robotic devices. So think that through and explore the use of various robot digital devices, automation processes, to um, engage students in their learning about digital technologies and come up with five lessons that would be used to teach students how to do that robot rescue task.